Yesterday, I watched a video on YouTube that was a recent update to the story of the boy in the box. I made a video about this. It was very, um, I, I never feel like I do justice to the stories that I talk about because I really just go and, and read what other people have posted about it and just give my thoughts. But this case was just so horrible. This little child, um, not that his family deserves answers if there are any of them still alive, but it's a possibility that he does have ancestors or relatives who are alive who don't know this uh, anything about his existence. At the last, when I made my video, there was they were awaiting the possibility that he was somehow connected to a family in Tennessee. And from what I read about this, what I watched this video yesterday, was that his DNA was taken. They had extracted his teeth and taken DNA from his teeth and put it into the uh, Parabon uh, system where they try to connect... Um, people who've been arrested and criminals DNA in the databases to people and also the genealogy databases where people are trying to find their ancestors and relatives missing people and they really thought because of um, the fact that the family involved here it was told by a landlord that these people had sold a child and then left the state, moved to Tennessee. Um, the, some ancestors of this family were con contacted, and it turned out he was not a match. But is it possible? And this happens sometimes. And in the f case that there was a th that this that there's a possibility, a lot of people believe that he may have been a child of the local foster home that he might have been a child of a, a woman a girl a young woman who um, lived at that foster home was a daughter of the people that ran it is it possible that they tested the dna of who they thought was his biological father and there was no match because Maybe he had been told that he fathered this child, and he didn't. So it's not in, impossible that he was not this person's child, but it could have just been that the man in this scenario was not his relative and that the mother was. I don't know anything about the mother in this case, if, she's, if, her, if they know who she was or if she was tested. I do know that it was believed and possible and there were some um, indications that he may have been the child of someone at that foster home because of the, the box that he was found in. They had a bassinet in that home that matched the one that would have been in that box. And... Um, I'm not sure if it was the same one or not. I don't know if they had the like the, the number. They had the number on the box. They were able to find out where the item was sold, what store it was sold in, but I'm not sure if it was the same bassinet or not, but it was one just like it. That was one indication. Another was that this young woman, it was rumored that her mother had died and that she had become the wife or the... Um, Faux wife of her stepdad and it's a possibility that that's the case because at that time you know it was possible that he killed this woman and took up with the daughter and or it was also possible that she just died and he turned to this young girl you know and it was rumored that she had had a couple of children and that one of her children had died in a freak accident, was playing on one of these quarter or dime or whatever it was back in that day, uh, hobby horses that you would find in front of grocery stores, and that he was playing on that and that it malfunctioned or something that he was electrocuted. 
So has the DNA from that child been tested as a match to this child? Because if it was her, her child, would they not have been testing? And was her DNA ever taken and tested? I'm not sure. I need to go look that up. I should have done that before I started making the video. But I just wanted to come back and do a little follow-up on that because he was not linked to the people in Tennessee as everyone had hoped that he might be. So they could finally get some closure for this child because the detectives and the people who were still trying to research this are running out of time. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but this happened in 1969. The child was thought to have been, they, they thought he was somewhere between the ages of three and six, but it's possible he might have been older because of his malnourishment and the fact that he was so abused. Uh, the woman, the the woman who was supposed to have been the daughter of these people who claimed that her mother had bought a child from a poor family, and um, that that was the child, and that she told a psychiatrist that she um, cut his fingernails and his toenails, and when his body was found, his toes and fingernails had just recently been cut. Was it possible that, and the people involved here, the people who were supposedly the parent, you know, the people that bought this child, they were scientists. They were, they were profess, professors at, at the college. And the, the husband was a scientist of some kind. The child was found to have had surgical scars on parts of his body. Was it possible that this child was used for experiments, you know? some kind of Dr. Frankenstein style stuff, I don't know, to write papers on for his, you know, thesis or whatever. And, he, and they were both published in, in these journals. So has anybody looked into that to see what type of uh, subject matter they were published with to see if it might lead to that being a possibility? This was dismissed because they said this woman had um, mental disorders. But if you look at her history, she was a college graduate. She worked in the pharmaceutical industry. She was a high-ranking uh, person in the pharmaceutical industry. She had a good education. She played sports. Uh, and she was uh, articulate. And she came out and told this story years later, and people were like, poo poo on that that didn't happen and possibly because of who these people were and who they were leaked to and the fact that it was thought to and she it was told by her that it was a child uh, trafficking pedophilia ring of these upper class people and it could be that some of the people involved in that was covering that up and if that's the case they may never get to the bottom of who this child was so she, when it came out in some of the uh, social media pages of who she was, and her name got leaked and her information got leaked, it was reported that she left the country. Now, we're talking about 53 years ago when this took place. The child may have been as old as seven, so he would have been 60 today. If he had brothers and sisters... From that same mother they would probably not be much difference in age and they probably are still living have any have have they reached out or was it that the that all those children were sold and taken and that was investigated but like I said high-ranking people people in the hierarchy of that uh, this was in Philadelphia and these people were employed by the, the high school and the university there. They were scientists. They were members of these elite groups of people. It's possible that it was covered up. It's also possible that this was their biological child. But I don't think that that's the case because if it were, did DNA match this woman or did she give DNA? 
And is it possible that she wasn't even their biological child? If they bought one child, is it possible they bought yet another child? She claimed that she also, her and this child both, suffered sexual abuse and, and physical abuse and that the child was starved, kept down in a dirty basement, and um, that the night that he died, his mother had become angry and beat him to death because he had thrown up, probably because he couldn't hold food down. And um, this is the story that this woman told, and she was basically just mis dismissed and poo-pooed because it was said that she had psychological problems because she was seeing a psychiatrist. Well, why did they think she might have been seeing a psychiatrist? Years of abuse and a nightmare of these memories and then having nobody take her seriously. But if it's a fact that this child was bought, could it be possible that this child was bought and they they really thought we're going to buy us another child or maybe that, you know, they couldn't have another child if she was their biological child. Could it be that they bought this child with the thoughts of we're going to raise him as ours and we're going to tell everyone that he's ours and we're going to have two kids and we're going to be a happy family to the community and the child might have had health problems he might have been very sick there was one there was surgical scars indicating that he had had surgery in his chest maybe his heart he had a cut down scar on his ankle that could have been from an IV from maybe uh, when, a, when a child's very young sometimes they can't get an IV in a vein so they do a cut down and could it be that he had so many health problems that he was just not material to to put him out in front of everybody and say, look at our happy little boy and look at our happy family. So she abused the child out of some kind of anger that she had paid for this perfect child and he turned out not to be. I don't know the answers to any of this. The police don't know the answers there are still people in the law enforcement who are retired and they form these groups to come back and do cold cases. And they've tried and tried to find links to this story, to try to find the truth about this. If this woman um, told the truth, uh, why was she dismissed so easily. If this was a family from another neighborhood who lived in a normal everyday home, they didn't have connections to the college, the uh, police, uh, you know, high-ranking officers, high-ranking members of the church, high-ranking members of the government, high-ranking members of the community, if they were just your average John Smith family, would her claims have been so quickly dismissed? And would they have really looked into that? Looked at, and, and the people that lived in the neighborhood claimed, there was never any child like that here. We never saw a child like that. Well, they kept him locked in the basement, according to this woman. He was more or less a, according to her, he was more or less just used as a, toy to these sickos, these sick, perverted, disgusting people. And I'm not going to dismiss this woman's claims as quickly as they did. It could turn out that she was lying the whole time. Maybe she had psychological issues that made her remember it that way. Or maybe it's possible that, it, that she remembers it perfectly the way that it happened and nobody will take her serious. But either way, they have never been able to link this child to anybody through DNA. And I hope one day that they do, and I hope that I'm around to hear it when it happens. And I hope that these cops who've worked so hard for the last so many years trying to find more information, I hope that they're around when this finally comes out. Because this child didn't deserve to be left in a cardboard box. And here's another little tidbit about this 
for anybody who hasn't heard about this story or didn't go back and watch other videos about this. The person who originally found this kid was supposedly out searching for uh, muskrat traps. Was this child kidnapped and abused by these people and murdered and then left in this box? And did they have some ties to that family? Do they have some ties to that college? So, here is, let me see, I'm trying to find the most recent article about this. Well, here is the story about who found the child. This is from the American Hauntings, The Boy in the Box, The Tragic Unsolved Mystery, The Most Enduring Mystery to Ever Perplex Detectives Came to Light on February 23, 1957, when a LaSalle College student parked his car and began to hike across a vacant lot in the rain. The unnamed young man um, was a peeping Tom and said he was en route to spy on the inmates of the Good Shepherd Home, a Catholic residence for wayward girls. But what he found as he walked across the overgrown lot that night would destroy any interest he had. It was a cardboard box seeming, seemingly discarded until he looked inside and saw a small corpse wedged into the back of the box. Terrified, he forgot about what he was there for and began to run away. He turned back and ran to his car. The man confessed his discovery to his priest the next day, and he was told to call the, compl call the police. Um, he said that he was chasing a rabbit through the weeds and stumbled upon the box. This would begin. This would be the beginning of a heartbreaking story that has yet to be closed. So it goes on to talk about the things found in the box: a leather strap with a buckle, a royal blue corduroy hat that they found out later had been specially made. But they didn't know who the person was that had it specially made. Um, he was 41 inches tall, weighed around 30 pounds. He was severely dehydrated. Um, the cause of death was listed as a savage beating that had left the boy's body and face covered in bruises. He had odor marks including scars on his chin, surgical scars on his chest, he had scar, a well-heeled scar on his groin. Now, they say it's possible it was a hernia surgery, but it could have been that he did have heart disease and that they had gone in through his groin to do a cath. Um, basically, this child was just beat to death and had scars all over him from incision. So... I just wanted to come back and kind of talk about how it came about that he was found. He was found, he was buried in a potter's field near the Philadelphia State Hospital, which is a mental institution. Uh, the case went cold silent until November of 1998 when the boy in the box was exhumed to extract DNA samples. Um, they tried again in 2000, and this time they took the DNA from the boy's teeth. Um, and they were also able to extract DNA. Um, let's see. Just I'm just reading through some of the stuff I've already talked about. Um, there have been many theories over the years as to what may have caused, uh, what may have led to the death of the boy in the box. Many have been dismissed, but two possible solutions. Um, there was a foster home in the area, a little more than a mile from the vacant lot where the boy's body was found. Uh, an employee of the medical examiner's office, it's, it's just a story about how he made up this whole story about the child's family being poor and that they couldn't afford a funeral and that they had started what would essentially today be a GoFundMe 
to raise money to bury this child in the hopes that it would lure this family out if they thought there might be some money in it for them. But it went unfounded, and he had basically made up this whole story just to get his name in the paper and be part of this. Um, the police were unable to find any real links between the family at the foster home and the boy in the box. Um, several members of the police who had been forming a, a society to search for information on cold cases um, confirmed that the family was not involved in the DNA was, was ruled out the, the stepdaughter was not the boy's mother so that ruled that out uh, the second theory emerged when a woman identified as M claimed that her mother had purchased the boy who they called Jonathan from his birth parents in 1954 this girl told so many stories that were so, she told about his hair having been cut, that he had just been bathed right before this, he was taken to the, to the um, box and left in the hills of the woods. His nails had recently freshly been cut. He had eaten, she said, a meal of baked beans and he got sick and threw them up, probably from the malnourishment that he just couldn't hold food down and she told that and they found the beans in the boy's stomach upon the autopsy so why did they dismiss this who was these people these parents that were so influential that the police were willing to dismiss this when there was so much evidence and even a passerby she told the story that she and her mother had put the boy in the back of the car. And when they got to the place where they were going to remove the boy, they stopped to get him out. And a passing by motorist stopped to ask if they needed help. And they told him no, they didn't need any help, and he drove away. She tells this, and then he go. this man had come forward at that time and told of the strange occurrence that he had seen these people removing a box. And they still dismissed this woman's story. None of this stuff was released to the public. So how did she know it? You know? And I know I'm getting worked up about it, but it just makes me so mad that because people have influence, because their name is, is connected to high-ranking people in education and police and to the church, that this was dismissed. It's ridiculous. And because the neighbor said we never saw the boy, that was a lie. Well, maybe they were in on it. Maybe they were a part of this secret society of pedophiles that this woman told about. She told about having been sexually and physically abused by her parents and this young boy too and other adults who were known to associate with this family and she told about having been sexually abused by some of these people. And nobody took her seriously. It's no wonder she went into hiding. She probably went into hiding and moved out of the country for fear that somebody would come out to get her. And I hope that one day I can come back and say, you know, they did a follow-up and they found DNA matched somebody. Um... Did they ever investigate anybody connected to that uh, girl's home in the neighborhood? Could it be possible that one of the girls who was at that place had given birth to a child? And, um, I mean, this child would have been older. But maybe she, you know, I don't know. I don't know. And, and if anybody does know, they're either dead or they're hiding the facts and the truth. And this child um, probably has brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins, nieces and nephews out there in the world who don't know that they're related to him. Maybe it's better that they don't because then they would go down that rabbit hole of trying to find out why this happened and why it was covered up. But maybe that's a good thing because maybe they'll find just the one in charge who covered all this up, you know?
But thanks for listening, and I just wanted to come back and do a little follow-up because when I left off my video, um, it was, they were waiting, they were on their way, they were going, they went to Tennessee and I believe Texas and tested two potential father and a potential brother, and it turned out that the DNA did not match either. So as of right now, this case still remains a code case, unsolved, one of, probably one of the United States' worst, um, most notorious, well-known cases of, um, of an identified person. But it's the fact that it's a little boy who probably suffered every day of his life from the time he was born, or at least from the time that he came into contact with these nut jobs. And I, I fully believe this woman, and maybe, I mean, like I said, this has been 52, 53 years ago. She would be probably approaching her 70s right now. Um, I, if I were her, I believe that I would contact someone who would help me to tell the story. Someone who would put it out in the world, and that it would be worldwide not in an Amer not in an American news source by the way because we all know what would happen to the story if it went to an American news source especially if it was rumored or or proven to have anything to do with anyone whose family may have been in a position of government or something like that it would be swept under the rug forgotten about and changed and she would have been put out there on blast as this crazy lunatic. There's stuff that goes on in this world to little children that they don't deserve and should never happen to them. And this child's proof of that. And we're looking at 53 years later, and he is such a source of secrecy to the family that was involved here that it's... Personally, I think still being covered up at that time, they might have been big wigs, you know. And I know people are saying you're a conspiracy theorist, you're a nut job. <laughs> Maybe I am, but at least I would have been willing to really interrogate these people, really. But by the time this woman came forward, was this man and woman still living? Or were they already deceased by that point? I don't know. Thank you for listening.